Go ahead and take out your Bibles. Turn to the book of John, chapter number 6. John, chapter number 6. We've been in a study through the book of John since the beginning of the year, but we did take a couple weeks off from this study over the last couple weeks as we were speaking about Easter. And so we will jump back into our study this morning. You know, we're living in a time where it seems that we read quite a lot, quite often, uh, about well-known or high-profile Christians who are leaving the faith. Uh, just in the last couple years, I could name various worship leaders or musicians. I could uh, name a pastor or two that have walked away from the faith. They've said those things that we said we believed, we were wrong. We don't believe them anymore. We are walking away. We no longer identify, which is a term we hear a lot. We no longer identify as a Christian. There's a movement that has gained steam in the last few years. It's a movement, it's a term that you may or may not have heard. Really, it's one that I've only heard in the last couple of years myself. But there's a term that's going around a good bit called deconstruction. And the idea is those who are, as they would say, going through deconstruction, they're taking their faith, they're taking all that they say that they believe, all that they say that they've held to be true, and they are deconstructing this. They're tearing it down to its foundation throwing away the things that they no longer believe, and then rebuilding it. Now, it, on its surface, that actually sounds like not a bad thing to do. Because sometimes what they find is, you know, that thing that I've been harping on, that thing that I've been saying, this is right or this is wrong, it's not even in the Bible. It happened to be the preference or the opinion of the preacher I was under or some other leader who, who made me think that was right or wrong. But really, it has nothing to do with the Bible. It was just their opinion. Listen, you and I should examine our faith. We should examine our faith and our practice and say, you know, is this really lined up with Scripture or not? And if there's something that has crept in that is not, do away with it. That's, that's great. But what happens usually in this deconstruction, as I've been reading a good bit about it in recent, recent days, what often happens as people go through deconstruction is they take their faith down to the foundation and then when they start building, they no longer look to God's word as the source material for what they should build. Rather, they, they have deconstructed their faith to the point where now they say, now, what is currently acceptable by society? And if God's, if God's word says one thing, but society says, no, 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 we don't think that's okay anymore, then they side with, God's, well, I mean, they side with society rather than God's word. So now when they start reconstructing their faith, it is really not faith involved because God's word is put to the side and it's whatever is currently acceptable. And I keep saying currently acceptable because if you've been around a little while, you know what was acceptable in society in the 60s changed in the 70s, changed in the 80s, changed in the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s. And now it's changed again. Every year, things that are, were acceptable changed where it actually isn't getting better, but society is getting worse and worse. Things, some of the things that we hear about on a regular basis today, some of you would have just gone ahead and had a heart attack and died if you heard about it in the 60s happening. You would have thought, there is no way, that is crazy talk, there is, that never will happen. And yet now we're living through a lot of this stuff. Seeing some of this crazy, and oftentimes people in churches, believers, preachers, worship leaders, song uh, musicians, different ones are saying, hey, you know, I've stepped back and I've deconstructed my faith. And based on what I see in society, man, I just, I can't keep walking the way I used to walk and call myself a Christian. And it's a sad state whenever the, those that profess faith in Christ deny that faith because of what society is doing. It, it, this isn't actually a new phenomenon, though. Now, the term deconstruction is really kind of new. I mean, it's obviously you probably could have heard that term at, at some previous past, uh, at some previous generation. But the, the idea of Christian deconstruction being a fairly new idea in, in our society, it actually was happening a long time ago. And we'll see that in John chapter 6 this morning. But I want to kind of give you a word of encouragement as we enter into this. Something that Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse number 3. He was talking about the return of Christ. Jesus is going to come back. Now, a lot of times what people say is right before Jesus comes back, man, there's going to be a worldwide revival and things are going to be great and people are going to be turning to Christ. And while, yes, I do think that people are going to continue to come to Christ and maybe there will be some sort of revival in pockets, there won't be a worldwide revival right before Jesus comes back. As a matter of fact, here's what Paul said. Just before Jesus comes back, there will be a falling away 
first. So as the more that we see believers, professing believers, falling away, walking away from the faith, the more and more we see that. It tells me, hey, he could come any day. It, Jesus is coming again soon. Now, I can't say the end is, I, I've said this before, I don't say the end is near. Because I don't know if it's tomorrow or if it's 100 years from now. But I always say the end is nearer. It's nearer than it was yesterday. It's nearer than when you were a child. It's nearer than when your parents and grandparents were children. The return of Jesus Christ is nearer and nearer every day. And we see the signs all around us. And one of those being this great falling away. Now, maybe you, you're not aware of this. You're like, man, I haven't even heard of this. And that's great. It's just a lot of the materials that I read, whenever I read about the church and kind of the state of the church and, and preachers in general, I, I see a lot of this. And it's, it's very disheartening. But this morning, I want us to look at, at uh, an idea. And again, it kind of ties in with this deconstruction. But let us look in John chapter number 6, verses 66 through 69. The Bible says this, From that time... Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him, the him being Jesus. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered. And if, if you know anything about Simon Peter, of course Simon Peter answered. He always had something to say. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. As I mentioned earlier, I know today's senior day. And so maybe kind of you came in and you're like, well, all right, so we'll have some kind of challenge to the seniors. And maybe the rest of us can kind of just sit back because we graduated from high school a long time ago. I was reminiscing about that a little bit the other day. I was at a baseball game and one of the guys, I, I carry my glove with me in case one of the kids needed to throw. And one of the guys asked me about my glove. I was like, man, I've had that since I was in high school. And I got to thinking about it. I got it. I think it was in 10th grade. And I was like, that was, uh, take my shoes off. And then I got to come back. And I mean, 10th grade was 28 years ago because I graduated 26 years ago. June will be 26 years. So, I mean, you know, you might have come today thinking, man, I graduated so long ago. Senior day. Go get them. Get those seniors. I will. But this is really a message for all of us. This idea of deconstruction, because I, I want to bring a message this morning, not specifically about, again, I, I'm introducing it with deconstruction, but this idea of walking away. And the title of the message is going to be found there in our text, Will You Also Go Away? Will You Also Go Away? According to Lifeway Research, and this is where I'm going to tie why this is super relevant for our seniors and even our teenagers, our, our young adults, different ones. This is super relevant for all of us, really, but especially that group. Because Life Ray Research, over the years, they'll, they'll, they'll periodically do basically the same research and they'll update it. And, and what they'll tell you, if you look at this particular thing, is that of graduating seniors who go to church. Maybe they grew up in the youth group. Maybe they went to Sunday school as kids and they grew up in the youth group. And then they graduate from high school. According to Life Ray Research, 70% leave church when they graduate high school. 70 percent. I, 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 maybe you're like me. I mean, 70 percent. What is that? Well, let's let's talk about numbers. Let's say we have 100 seniors, church going, God fearing, Sunday school attending, youth group, you know, participating. Let's say we had 100 uh, seniors graduating. That means next week only 30 of them would be in church. 70 of that 100 would go away. And, and then the statistics took it further and said, OK, of that 70 percent that walks away, how many of them come back? And it found only about a third of those that walked away would come back. That means of those 70, about 23 of them will come back. So at the end of, and, and that's some years later. That's not they'll come back next year or two years or five years. It's sometime between 18 and 30 they'll eventually come back. And so what that means is at graduation, 100 seniors who go to church the next week, 30 of them will come back. And sometime in the next 10 or 12 years, another 23 of them will come back. So we're right at 50 percent will be back in church within the next 10 or 12 years. Total of 50 percent, the 30 that stayed and the 23 that will come back. We've got about 50 percent loss. Not only that, but really, I mean, the 50 percent loss, that the 50 percent will come back. But what about those years when they're still gone? When they do come back, that third that comes back to church, all the pain they bring with them, 
all the hurt that they bring with them, all the damage that they bring with them, all the things that they experienced when they were far from God for a few years that actually brought them back to God. They bring all those scars and all those, those battles and all of those hurts with them. Now, granted, this is the place they should bring it. Like, bring your hurt, bring all those trials, bring all of the things that you're going through. Hey, the church ought to be a safe place for you to come with that. But I want to challenge you. I'm not saying if you're in church today that you don't have any problems. We're going to talk about some of that today. Yeah, you, you, you might have problems. But you know what? Bring them with you because this is the place that you should be. Not out in the world wandering around just saying, well, hey, I'll just figure it out. But 70% of graduating seniors will walk away from their faith. And so this morning, I do want to challenge us in this, in this thought, will you also go away? You see, what happens with that 70% is many will go away to college and just not bother finding time for church. Some will start a job and they'll just get so busy with that, everything's focused on their job. Others think, hey, I'm finally out of mom and dad's house. They can't make me go to church anymore. I'm going to be my own man. I'm going to be my own woman. I'm going to make my own decisions and I'm just not going because mom and dad always made me and I don't want to anymore. As you go away, seniors, as you go away to college or you go away to your careers, at college, will you find time, will you make it a point to find Christian clubs and things that you can get involved in? Will you make it a point to find the Bible studies that you can plug into? Will you make it a point to find a church? Because I promise there is one. Some people go away and there just aren't any good churches around. And if you look at their college and you look like a 10 or 15 minute radius of their college, there's 753 churches of 490 different flavors. And they're like, there's just no churches here. Listen, where we live, like if you told me you were up in like the middle of Alaska out living in an igloo and there's nobody within 150 miles of you, I might would believe you. But that's not where you're at. And that's not where any of you are going to be going to college, to my knowledge. They are all in the south, which means there's a church. Will you take the time to find a church? Hey, listen, when you go out on your own, and this is something when Nikki and I got married that we did uh, after a time, you have the freedom to go and visit and choose one that fits where you're at in your faith, that fits what, what, what will challenge you. So it's not you're limited to, well, it's the first church I walk in. I'm stuck there for the next four years of college. No, go to that one. Go to a different one. Go to somewhere else until you find that one that God says, this is your home while you're at college. Hey, if you're working a career, are you going to be so busy that work, with work that you don't take time for worship? You see, you have to make those kinds of decisions. Maybe it is right now. I know. I mean, Kyle's one of the seniors that we'll be talking about here in a little while. Our son, hey, he hadn't had a choice. Uh, up to this point, I mean, he was born on a Tuesday and Sunday morning he was in church. And he's been there ever since. I mean, we probably, I, I don't know, we probably count on two hands the number of Sundays in his life he hasn't been in church somewhere. Because that's what we've chosen to do, which means, though, and we've talked to him in different, different capacities, not just church. There's so many capacities. In a few months, he won't be in our house. He will have the freedom to make those sorts of decisions on his own. What decisions will he make? Other seniors, others that are, that are, maybe you're not a senior, maybe you graduated a year or two, five years ago, whatever. What decisions are you making concerning your faith? Are you going to be faithful or are you going to wander? Will you also go away? This morning, I want to share a few reasons that I think of that came to mind as I was thinking of this idea. Will you also go away? I want to share a few reasons why people walk away. And I want to caution all of us because it, I know I'm emphasizing seniors, young adults, teenagers, but this really could happen to all of us. I, I've known adults who have just walked away. Again, the illustrations I told, and I didn't name names, and that was intentionally. I mean, one of the pastors I was thinking of, he was an author of a best-selling book in Christianity. He was a pastor of a, what we would call a megachurch, megachurch being defined as a church of over 2,000 people. We're almost there, but not quite a megachurch, all right? Uh, but a megachurch is defined as a church of 2,000 or more people. He was a pastor of a megachurch. He was a best-selling author, and he walked away from the faith. There's some things that we need to beware of so that that does not happen to us also. As we consider, will you also go away? Consider three things with me. Will you also go away, first of all, when there are distractions? I, I'm sure it comes as no surprise to say that there are a lot of distractions in this world. We, we, we see that all the time. We all face distractions of one sort or another. As a matter of fact, I, I know someone's going to come up to me later and say, hey, that, was, that, that really was upsetting what you said. It really triggered me there. But I mean, hey, it, it might be 
that you've got some house cleaning and laundry or, or, or some, something to do on your car, and you're like, I know I need to do that this Saturday. But man, do you see that sunshine? Man, do you hear the lake? It's calling my name. You see, it's a distraction. You need to get some work done, but you're like, but it's not going to be beautiful like this every Saturday. I'll do the laundry and the other stuff on Monday or, or Tuesday. I'll, I'll get to it later. And, and there's that distraction, the lake calling your name. It, it could be that the boss ha has a project. He's like, hey, I really need you to work on this project. But right now, there's a decision you and your wife are having to do or you and your husband. You, you, there's a decision you've got to make. And so your mind is there and your boss is telling you to do a project. It's a distraction. Maybe you're in school and there's a project, a paper that's due next week. You know you need to do it. But man, this game I just got oh, it is awesome. And I'm just going to spend all night, every night, all day. I'm going to play this game. And then comes the day of the paper. And you're like, huh, I bet I should have been working on that sooner than the day of. See, there are distractions all throughout life. We all know that. None of us are unaware of distractions. But you know what? Some distractions can even be deadly. Hey, if you're, if you're operating a, a piece of heavy machinery, you need to focus. Because if you start let your attention wander and see what someone else is doing, anything could happen. I, I've seen where someone gets distracted or, or, or they just lean over uh, a piece of machinery and they had some loose-fitting clothing that got caught in that. Man, it could be deadly. See, distractions can pull us away. In his parable about the sower and the seeds, Jesus said this in Matthew 13, verse 7. He, he talked about the seeds that were sown in these different types of ground. And he mentioned thorny ground. He, he said, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Now, when you first read the parable of the sower and the seeds, you read it, and some of it's like, that's a cool story, Jesus. I don't know what that has to do with anything. You're talking about a guy went out, he sowed seeds, and it fell on different ground at the end. But right after that, the disciples even came to Jesus and said, Jesus, okay, there had to have been a point to that story. What was it? Like, what were you trying, what scriptural, what spiritual uh, truth were you trying to convey in that parable? They said, all right, well, sit down and I'll tell you. And here's what he said when he talked about the, the, the seed that fell among the thorns. He said, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the cares of this world and the, the, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. You know, we could take that phrase, the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and we could just say distractions. You see, the seed that is sown in thor thorny ground represents those who receive God's word and start to bear fruit. But then something distracts them. And rather than continuing to grow in their faith, they give in to the distractions and they become unfruitful. Their growth is halted. Again, I've known people through the years. I've known people who were faithful, who served, who were always there. And then something distracted them. The new thing, the shiny thing, the, the whatever, it, it got their attention. And rather than staying faithful to Christ, continuing to grow in their faith, they were distracted and they were pulled away. I mean, we could start a list right now, whether that's their job or a hobby or sports or, or friends or, what, or family. Hey, I know that may be like, I don't have family. I mean, family's first. And fa I love my family. I, I make time for my family. But you know what? My family cannot rise to a level where they are more important than God. Because the Bible teaches us anything that we put in the place of God, it's an idol. You know what? Your family can be an idol. God, I love you more than anything. You are, you are number one in my life. You are everything to me, God. You are so good to me. I love you. And Oh, man. But my family, they need me. My, I got to do this for my family. I got to go here for my family. Hey, if we allow family to take the place of God, our family is an idol. It's a distraction from what's most important. Paul even talked about someone in his ministry that this happened to. 2 Timothy 4.10, he says, For Demas, this guy named Demas, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas got a taste of the world and said, Wow, I like that more than I like traveling with Paul. Because traveling with Paul, there's a good chance I'm going to end up in prison. I'm going to end up beaten. I'm going to end up shipwrecked. And I just don't know that serving God with Paul is better than living for the world. Because they got it going on. They're not getting beaten and shipwrecked and stuff. Listen, young people, seniors, you're going to get out. And some of you I know have already had a taste of this, but you're going to start making money. You're going to get out. And you're going to have freedom. And you have to decide, is that more important than my walk with Christ? 
That, that's going to be a decision you have to make. Years ago, I used to teach a, a, a middle school Sunday school class. And every year when the new class would start, you know, new kids would come in. I would say kind of the same thing to all of them. Starting in middle school, sixth grade, we had sixth through eighth grade. And I would really start emphasizing at that age that they were entering into years that would shape the rest of their lives. That in those years, they were going to decide if their faith was really theirs or if it was just mom and dad's. And you know what? Hey, some of you, you've been wrestling with some of that throughout your middle and high school. And now you're graduating, going to college, starting careers. And now it's when the rubber meets the road. Are you going to be distracted by all the stuff or is your faith real? Is it yours? Consider what Jesus said in Matthew 6, He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, that doesn't mean if you seek Christ, all these things, a brand new car, the brand new boat, the brand new house, all the money in the bank, all these things will be added to you. No, no. Jesus is very specific what he's talking about. He had just finished talking about clothing, food. He, he did talk about money also. He said, if you, th these necessities, these things that are needed for life. Yes, food, clothing, and money, they're all necessities. These are things you need. And he, and he gives examples. He says, look at the birds, look at the flowers, look at all these things that God takes care of. Don't you think he'll meet your needs too? But you seek first. The kingdom of God. Don't get distracted by all the other stuff. Listen, seniors, there's going to be a lot of distractions. Don't give in to those. Listen, adults, middle-aged adults, senior adults, there's distractions out there. And, and, and I'm speaking to some that maybe already gave in to them. You're here today, and you're like, I'm in church, but what's the rest of your life look like? Just because you gave God an hour on Sunday morning doesn't mean you're walking with him faithfully and daily and growing in your walk. Are you distracted by all the stuff? Will you also go away? Have you been distracted? Second thing, will you also go away when there are difficulties? There are going to be things that distract us, but also there's going to be difficult times that we go through. Anybody in here ever gone through a difficult time? Let's just show of hands. Anybody? Okay, I, I kind of figured I might get one or two. I mean, those that didn't raise their hand were over there going, oh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, let me tell you. Look, you got an hour? I'll tell you the last one thing. Hey, sometimes life is difficult. And now, here's the thing. And I remember, I mean, I remember growing up, being a teenager, we didn't have everything, but you know what? My needs were met. I always had clothes. I didn't have, you know, the nicest stuff, but I always had stuff. I had clothes. I had food. I remember when I got an apartment, it was the craziest thing. I had to buy toilet paper. I mean, what is up with that? Like that stuff doesn't grow on the roll, which is just weird why someone hasn't inv invented that yet. Like when I went to the grocery store, no one was just like, hey, your mom called ahead and she took care of this for you. Like I had to buy my frozen pizza and my cans of tuna. I mean, I wasn't eating quite as good as I used to. But hey, you'll find as you get more responsibility, some days is hard. Sometimes that check that when you were living at mom and dad's house and you got a little job and you had money and you're like, man, I got so much money in the bank. Like, I'm going to be a millionaire in no time. Once you get out and you have your own bills, you're like, who stole my money? All right. Because I didn't get less money. I actually have a little more money now, but I can do less with it. Who's stealing it? Sometimes life's hard. Sometimes that paycheck doesn't go quite as far as it used to. Living paycheck to paycheck isn't quite as easy as it used to be. Sometimes things happen, things break down, and it's on you to take care of it. Listen, if you think, not me, just, just ask around. You've got a room full of people that will tell you, oh yeah, sometimes life is hard. Sometimes you're going to suffer loss. Sometimes you're going to fail at some venture that you've set forth to do. Sometimes you're going to be rejected. And this will go on and on and on. And for some reason, a lot of Christians think if I give my life to Christ, if I say I'm a follower of Christ, everything's going to be smooth sailing from there. Like, where do they get this from? Do they get it from the disciples? These guys that followed Jesus, that stayed with Jesus, that were the closest companions of Jesus. I mean, this idea of if you just follow Jesus, everything will be great. Look at the disciples. 
Take out Judas who betrayed him. You look at the 11 that faithfully followed. All but one suffered a martyr's death for following Christ. The one that did die, uh, not a martyr's death. He died of old age, but he had been persecuted, boiled in oil, left uh, as an outcast on an island by himself. Didn't exactly have an easy life. Those were the disciples. This idea that life's going to be easy if you're a follower of Christ, it did, it, maybe it came from Jesus. The disciples were just a fluke. What about what Jesus said? Jesus said in John 15, verses 19 and 20, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. That doesn't sound fun. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Maybe that was just a one-time thing. Maybe, he, maybe it was just one time things were bad right then. He was having a bad day. He told his disciples that. John 16, 33, these things have I spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. All right, so it's not the disciples we get this idea from. It's not Jesus. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's the Apostle Paul. I mean, Paul had a good life. Paul had an easy life. Except we already kind of alluded to some of that a few minutes ago. Paul gave us a list in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 27. I, I dare say you can't find someone that you can look at and say they were more faithful than Paul. They were more faithful to follow Christ and to, and to be committed to him than Paul was. And here's what Paul said. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul didn't have it easy. There were difficulties in life. All right, well, okay, so there were the disciples, and then there was Jesus, and then there was Paul. I'm sure somebody, what about James? James was the brother of Jesus. What did he say? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials, knowing this. The trying of your faith worketh patience. Right, so you're saying we should rejoice when things are hard and we're following Jesus. Huh. It kind of sounds like at some point in your life, if you haven't already, you will go through difficulty. Will you in that difficult time say, I'm done. God, I thought this was going to be easy. I thought you were going to take care of everything. I thought I was going to be filthy rich. I thought I was going to be always healthy. I thought I would never lose anything. I thought I would never fail. It's not worth it. Will you also go away in times of difficulty? Back to the sower and the seed. In Matthew 13, 5, Jesus spoke about the seed falling among the stony ground. Last was thorny ground. Then he talks about, or he talks about the stony ground. He said, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Disciples, Jesus, what does that mean? He said, I'll tell you. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet hath he not root in himself. But he endureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Oh man, I love what that preacher had to say. Jesus wants to save me from my sins. I don't have to die and go to hell. I can have a home in heaven. Man, that eternal life, that streets of gold thing, that's for me. I love that. And they get saved, and that's awesome. And they're like, oh, God is so good. And then a hard time comes because they're reading their Bible at work and someone's like, you know, Bible, that's such an outdated book. What a loser you are. I just thought everyone would like me when they saw that I was reading the Bible. Hey, hey, hey listen, I want to tell you about my Jesus. Jesus, man, I don't need no Jesus. Are you crazy? You're not one of those. Are you one of those Bible thumpers? Are you one of those holier than thou? Why isn't everyone wanting what I got? Why are people rejecting me when I'm trying to tell them about Jesus? Don't they know? And it says whenever that persecution came for the word. They walked away. Hey, sometimes life is hard. And sometimes when you're following Christ and trying to live for him and share his love with others, sometimes it's hard. Will you walk away when it gets hard? 
You see, there are going to be some seasons in life that are easy. I mean, I'm sure we could go around. I know everyone's like, yeah, I've had a difficult time at some point. I'm, I'm sure we could go around the room and talk about some easy times too, though. Man, that was that time when just it seemed like the Lord was blessing. We had money in the bank. Bills were being paid. Everyone was happy. Our kids were being kind to each other. No one was fussing or fighting. Everyone seemed to love us, and it was just great. And we'd walk outside, and it was like Mary Poppins, you know. The birds are singing, and the flowers are blooming, and it's just people are whistling. and oh, It was just great. Maybe you've had that time at some point. But life's not always like that. There may, have those, there may be those seasons of easiness, but they don't stay that way because there'll be those difficult periods in there too. When you face difficulty, will you walk away? Listen, John, uh, Jesus said in John 16, 33, I just read you the first half of the verse earlier because I was emphasizing that idea of that we will suffer. But in John 16, 33, that verse said, These things have I spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But then he finished it, but be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Like, yes, it, you may have some hard times in this world, but this world is not the end. This world is not your final destination. As a follower of Christ, your final home is in heaven with him. And yes, he may allow you to walk through those times of hardship. He may allow you to go through those times of hardship. Listen, David, the psalmist said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear, fear no evil, for thou art with me. The, the valley of the shadow of death. That's not, my car broke down on the side of the highway. And I had to wait 15 minutes for someone to come pick me up. Like, that stinks. But that's not walking through the valley of the shadow of death. There's going to be some hard times, but I don't have to be afraid because thou art with me. There's going to be some times where you are giving it everything you've got and you're going to fall on your face. I, I like to throw that word of encouragement out every now and then. You will fail. All right. I, I just write that down. If you take a note, you will fail. Embroider it on something. Cross stitch it, hang it on the wall, you know, something everyone can see with a little sunshine on it, some flowers. You will fail. Word of encouragement from Brother David. Because a lot of times we're not told that we're going to fail. And so when we fail, it's like, what? Nobody told me. There's going to be times you're going to fall. There's going to be times sin comes in and you're like, I'm a follower of Christ. I don't even have to worry about sin. Wait, what? Man, that looks pretty good. And you're saying, how did I get in sin? I'm a follower of Christ. You know what the psalmist said also? Psalm 37, 23 and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Oh, that's good. That's awesome. God says, walk this way. Oh, man, God, I'm walking this way. Walk this way. I'm walking this way. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That's good stuff. And he delighteth in his way. God, you are so good. Man, you're always so good. You give me the steps to walk. This is great. Thank you, God. Though he fall. No, wait, you were talking about the steps and the good man and, and the Lord ordering them. And what are you talking about falling? David knew. Oh, my goodness, David knew. Oh, man, hey, you walk with the Lord, talk with the Lord, follow his steps. It's all good, but you can fall. There can be some difficult times. Even as a believer, sin can raise up and you can be like, man, that actually kind of looks pretty good. And you can fall. But well, that's not where the verse ends. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I love that verse. And I love the picture that comes to my mind. Good night, Kyle graduating next month. What in the world? I think about when Kyle or any of our others were little kids. And, and you, know, you know how it is. If you've had kids, you're walking with them. And you're just walking along. Boo -ba -doo -ba -doo, and you step up and forget that their legs are like two inches long and they don't get to step up and they trip. When they trip, do you just let go of them? Boom. And what do you do? You hold on. And in that moment, their feet ain't under them, but you still got them. Now, they may be hanging there like this, but you're upholding them with your hand. Listen, Christian, there are going to be hard times. There's going to be times sin raises its head and you're like, that looks good. And you find yourself falling into sin. God doesn't let you go. I'm like, Psh. done with you. The Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Listen, you're going to make some bad decisions sometime. Whether you're one of those seniors or a high schooler or a middle schooler or whether you're an adult that should know better. You're going to make some bad decisions. God doesn't quit on you. Don't quit on him. Will you also go away when things get hard, when there are distractions, when there are difficulties? And finally, 
Will you also go away when there are disappointments? Again, I, I don't think that it would be any shock to say there have been times in all of our lives where we've been disappointed about something. Something has happened and we're like, oh, that is not how I saw that playing out. Matter of fact, in our text, I know we start in the text and I've, I've given you a bunch of verses and we kind of haven't gotten back to the text. But when, Jesus, when it says that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. If you go back and read literally like the last 40 verses before this. At the beginning of the chapter, you have the feeding of the 5,000. All right. Then you have Jesus walking on water. And then for about 40 verses, here's what happens. I'll give you the summary. Go back and read it yourself. It's really more in-depth than what I'm about to say. Some of the people that had seen him feed the 5,000 who had been present, they found him again. They, you know, he had walked on water. He had gotten across. They're like, where's Jesus? He was just here. I know he didn't get on that boat. His disciples did. But now Jesus is gone. Someone runs ahead and they're like, hey, he's over here. So then they get around. They're like, Jesus, how'd you get here? You weren't on the boat. He doesn't really bother with that. He doesn't answer. But they get, to, they get to their point. They're like, hey, by the way, we saw what you did. We were over there. We had a fish sandwich on the other side of the lake. You know, it's about dinner time now the next day. Like, we're kind of hungry again. If you're really who you say you are, why don't you fix us some dinner? Why don't you work another miracle? Why don't you snap your fingers, blink your eyes, do what you do, and give us some more fish sandwiches? Because I'm the best, best fish sandwich I've ever had. Will you hook us up? And if I can just summarize, Jesus said, no. I ain't going to do that. Instead, he says, hey, I am the bread of life. You don't need a fish sandwich. You need me. Then it gets kind of weird. I'm just going to be honest with you. He starts talking about you got to eat me. Like, you know, he talks about the bread. And then what he's talking about is you need to receive me. But it's just kind of weird. And some of them are like, so you're not going to work a miracle for us. And instead, we need to eat you. All right, bye. And they leave. That's not what they came for. They came for a meal. They came for a miracle. They came for their needs to be met. They didn't come to be told, I'm the only way to, to the Father. You can't get to Him unless you come through me. You can't come to me unless you're willing to partake of what I'm going to go through. You must identify with the suffering, with my body being broken and my blood being shed. You must come to me through that. So you're not going to overthrow the Romans? I mean, they, people were talking about you being the Messiah. We all know the Messiah has to get rid of the Romans. That's got to be what the Messiah is all about. It's not what I'm here for. And so they walked away disappointed. There can be times in life where you are disappointed. There's going to be times in life where you don't get the job. I know I'm qualified. I know I had a good interview. I know my resume was on spot because on point because I, I talked to this guy and he gave me pointers and I even paid him like 10 bucks and he looked at my resume and he, he reworded some things. I mean, it was perfect. Never seen a more beautiful resume. And I, and I dressed up and I, I dressed for the job that I want to have, you know, so I had a suit on and a tie and I, I, I used, you know, good words. And I didn't just be like, I'm the goodest for this job you ever did see. Uh, you know, I, I like spoke properly. I remembered all the things my teachers taught me and I, I, I used complete sentences and I didn't say um and uh. And I didn't be like, yo, I'm the bomb. I, I was like, I, I did all I was supposed to and I know I should get the job. And they don't even call you. You just get that reply email. We found someone else. Thanks for applying. Maybe next time. And that was the job. That was my dream job. That was the job I wanted for so long. Maybe you don't get the girl. Maybe you don't get the guy. But we were supposed to be together forever. When they broke up with me. There's a disappointment. There's heartbreak. I didn't get the girl, I didn't get the guy. I, I, I applied to a bunch of colleges and, and really there was only one I wanted to go to. The others I did just because mom and dad's I didn't need to have a fallback plan. And I just knew my GPA was there. I, I'd been involved in all kinds of activities. I'd done all the things. This was my dream college. And I didn't get in. What happened, God? I thought if I followed you, you would fix everything. You would take care of everything. I would get all the stuff. If I seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto me. Why, why didn't I get the job? Why didn't I get the girl? Why didn't I get the college? Why, why, why? Will you also go away because of disappointments? There's going to be a time. There are going to be times where it doesn't work out like we think it should. There's going to be times where it's not just disappointment that it didn't turn out right. There's going to be times where you're just disappointed with God. God, you messed up. 
God, you failed me. God, you didn't come through. You're going to feel like, man, I'm disappointed in you, God. Like if you could give God that look that your parents gave you when you messed up, you would do that. Like, mm, mm, God, you just, mm, 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 mm. There's going to be times where we face disappointment. I, I want to remind you of something that God said, though, to his people in Isaiah. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And if you really get a grasp of this, and if you, if, not just, I've memorized that verse, and I know what it says, and oh yeah, it's so good, and I believe it. Like, if you really get a grasp of this, and you really make it a part of your life, I think it'll change your life. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. Well, okay, so we got different thoughts on things. I got that. No, no, it's not just, I got a thought, God's got a thought. Which way are we going to go? Look at the next verse. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's not my way or God's way. It's my way, God's ways. God, I'm so disappointed you didn't let me have my way. Listen, if we could get a, get, just, just get this. God says, yeah. But if I'd given you your way, man, that would have stunk. Because you don't even know what you need. If I'd let you have your way, you'd be settling for this. But kid, I got this for you. That doesn't mean, oh, you're going to be a multi-padrillionaire. I just made that number up. <laughs> All right? It doesn't mean, oh, want to buy Twitter? No problem. Here's the money. Like, it's not like that, okay? That doesn't mean if I follow God, I'm going to get all that money. But he's saying, you were going to settle for this because that's as much as you could think. You thought, this would be so awesome. He's like, you have no idea what I have for you. So maybe you're disappointed. Maybe you're like, God, why did you do? I'm just done with you. Listen, seniors, high schoolers, adults, old adults, or older adults, uh, anybody. You might be disappointed right now. Something may have happened. It could have been 20 years ago and you're still living in that disappointment. Isaiah 55, 8, 9. Get your mind right. Your ways. You're disappointed because God didn't give you what you wanted. He has something so much better in, in store for you. Get your mind right and say, I, I'm going to give up this and I'm going to focus on you. One of the problems a lot of people face when disappointments come and I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, is that nobody prepared them that disappointments would come. When I asked around the room, and they, you know, kind of, I didn't ask for a show of hands, but everybody in the room, when I said, hey, did you know sometimes things are going to be disappointing? Everyone in the room's like, yeah. Some of you looked at the person sitting next to you, and that was rude. You shouldn't do that. Um, but, like, yeah, disappointment. <clears throat> so much disappointment. So long, so long I've been disappointed. Stop that, all right? That's rude. Don't do that. But everyone here says, at some point, I've been disappointed. But you know what a lot of times we don't do? We don't teach our kids that they're going to be disappointed someday. So we, grow, we let them grow up thinking, everything's great, and everything's fine, everything's always going to be. And then when that first disappointment hits, they're like, I can't believe this. Why did this happen? This week, Walt Merrill, who is the, the district attorney of Covington County, posted something. And, and it was, as I was studying, he posted something like, Okay, if you want to help me preach my sermon, that's cool. Here's what he said. And listen, as a district attorney, I'm out, I, he posts stuff on Facebook. I've read his stuff. Like he, he encounters people in their worst day. He encounters people in their worst time. He encounters people that have been led astray and they're, I mean, they're facing serious jail time. He, he sees all of it. Here's what he said this week. If you raise your child to believe that they always deserve a trophy or that they always do a great job or that they never fall short or do a mediocre or less than job or that they lost the game because the ump stole the game or that they failed because someone wronged them or that they don't have to go to practice or that the teacher is always out to get them or that the coach is always wrong. Then one day when they have a boss who doesn't accept their less than eager efforts, then your child will be frustrated by the constructive criticism. And then they will steep in their own pride of believing that they couldn't possibly do any better because they are always right or they are always the victim and that their boss is wrong and just out to get them. And then they will get fired and never understand that you lied to them far too many times and to their own detriment. Children are minds and souls to be taught and molded. They are not many gods meant to be worshipped. 
Don't build their future on false beliefs before it will only result in resentment based on yesterday's lies. Instead, teach them well. Hey, listen, mom, dad. I know it's senior day. Don't talk to me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mom and dad. It's supposed to be senior day. Get them. Hey, listen, mom and dad. I'm talking to us too. Are we preparing our kids for that day when they face disappointment? Or have we raised them the whole time like you're just so precious and you're the bestest and no one ever does anything better than you and you never do anything wrong and you're always going to get what you want and you could be anything, anything you want. Astronaut? Yeah, I know you don't understand two plus two equals four, but you could be an astronaut. Hey, listen, if that's all we do, then someday someone's going to tell them, uh, no, you don't meet the qualifications. No, you're not good enough. No, you didn't do that right. And it's going to crush them because nobody ever told them there will be disappointment. And if you think that, well, I kept them in church. And so when they, I mean, I didn't tell them stuff might not always work out. But I mean, I'm sure they picked it up along the way somewhere. And they and they're going to face that soul-crushing disappointment. And all you ever taught them was, oh, everything's going to be okay. Just keep your eyes on God and everything will be great. Keep your eyes on God. That doesn't mean everything will be great. It means that He will get you through even those things that aren't great. But if you're not teaching them that, then whenever they get that soul-crushing disappointment, God failed me. I'm done. Listen, will you also go away? Jesus looked at his disciples, will you also go away? Are you going to be disappointed in what I have to say also? Hey, are you going to walk away when it's, there's distractions? Are you going to walk away when there's difficulties? Are you going to walk away when there's disappointments? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? And Peter answered him. Again, I said it earlier. Peter was always saying something most of the time, the wrong thing at the wrong time. But... There were a few times he got it right. And when he got it right, man, he got it right. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter got it right. If we leave you, there's no hope. You are the only way to heaven. You were the only hope of eternal life. You were the only one who can forgive our sins. Why would we walk away from you just because it didn't turn out like we thought it should? Now, full disclosure, a little bit later they do. Jesus is arrested. We talked about this two weeks ago. Jesus is arrested and all the disciples are like, that's not what we thought would happen. And they walked away. But they didn't stay away. They, they had that time where they fell. God held on to them. Three days later they're like, hey, we should probably come back because there's Jesus. That's a really rough interpretation of what happened, but you get it. We talked more about that a few weeks ago. Peter said, hey, why would we go to anyone else? Listen, anybody, I just seen anybody. Maybe you're dealing with that disappointment, that difficulty, or those distractions right now. Maybe something, hey, listen, speaking of distractions, I mean, we all, how many of you made it to church alive today? I'm questioning some of you because I'm not sure based on this service and you're just like, um, you know how to avoid distractions. Because you got here today. That means the kids screaming in the back seat, your favorite song coming on the road, uh, on the road. No, nah, it was on the radio. Uh, your favorite song on the radio, that gobbler or that deer that pranced across the road right then when you were driving by. Like you managed to stay on the road. You managed to get here. You know how to avoid distractions. Hard times, you've been through hard times, you've had financial hardships, you've had the loss of loved ones, you, and you've come out on the other side. Disappointments, how we talked about. At different times we've gone through all these things and many times you've managed. So at what point and why would you say, okay, but that one, that one I'm going to walk away. God, I'm done. Listen, he's always been faithful, and he's always been true, and he's always followed his word. He's never broken his word. It's just we've kind of tried to rewrite his word. We've tried to put things on him that he never said he was going to do. Why? Well, I'm a believer. I should never have a hardship. Nothing should ever go wrong. Listen, if we will follow him, he will do exactly what he said. If you've walked away, and again, you might be, I'm here Sunday morning. Obviously, I haven't walked away. You can be here. And be somewhere else completely, entirely in your heart and mind right now. 
and not heard a word I said. So as we wrap it up, if maybe you're one that's walked away, you're just here because someone made you, you're just here because someone invited you, you're just here, whatever. Hey, listen, God hadn't gone anywhere. He's still calling you back to Him. And today may be the day that you need to come back. Maybe it's tomorrow that something's going to happen that's going to tempt you to walk away. You remember today. Jesus is the only one with the words of eternal life. Jesus is the only one that cares so much for you. His ways, your ways. He, he thinks so much more, so much high, more highly about what he wants for you than you could ever hope or imagine. Maybe there's someone here, though, you've never given your life to Christ. You know, like this whole following Christ thing, I can't stop following him because I've never actually started. So this doesn't even apply to me. Listen, over the last few weeks, we talked a lot about what Jesus physically went through to provide us with salvation. He suffered and bled and died the most cruel death of all to pay for our sins. He did that because he loves us. And so if you're here today, you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. I, I beg you today, give your life to him. The Bible says if we will call out to him, confess that we're a sinner, receive the gift that he offers, acknowledging that, that he died, was buried and rose again, and we place our faith in that, he will save us and give us a home in heaven. That's a simplistic version of what he does and what happens. If you want to know more about it, I invite you here in a few moments. You can come during the invitation time. You can come see me afterwards. I would love to talk to you about what Jesus wants to do for you and how he can save you. Listen, if you've walked away, come back. If you've never come to him, now's the time. Will you also go away? Be faithful to him. Don't walk away no matter what happens. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this challenge. There are so many that are willing to walk away. There are so many that are willing at just the slightest thing. Or honestly, sometimes it's not slight. Sometimes it's huge. And they just they give up on you and they walk away. Maybe there's someone like that today. Lord, I pray that you would draw them to you. Show them that you are faithful and you are who you say you are and you do what you say you will do. Help them to recognize, like Peter, there's nowhere else to go for eternal life. You're it. Lord, maybe someone's frustrated today and they're looking to start walking away. May you encourage their heart today. Just remind them that your ways are better than theirs. Yours are so much higher than theirs. Lord, if there's one here that's never placed their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, may today something that was said, may, may it speak to them and may they recognize they need a Savior. And may they give their life to you today. God, we thank you for what you can and will do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you so much. You may be seated at this time. If my seniors and their families would come forward, and my youth workers. Y'all can stay down there. There'll be more room down there. Oh, I know, you've got one of your parents up here. So. Come on, come on. I was thinking this week, this is the fifth group of seniors that we've had um, since we've been here, since our family has been here. It's the fifth group of seniors uh, that we've had the honor of honoring uh, on a senior day. Uh, it is the first time that one of them is ours, so uh, we're excited about that. But we do have four seniors this year, and I'm going to read a little bit about them and uh, just tell you a bit about them. Then the youth leaders do have a gift for them, and they'll say a few words. Um, but the first one, and I just went alphabetical order, so this isn't like favoritism or anything. Just so you know, I was like, I better do this fairly. So last name, alphabetical order. But when you have V's and Z's on your last name, then if you're a Barker, you're going up to the top. All right. So Kyle Barker. Uh, Kyle is the son of me and Nikki Barker, uh, so David and Nikki Barker. Uh, he's been a homeschool student for 12 of his 13 years in school. During high school, Kyle has maintained a 4.0 GPA. He's been very active in the church through the youth group and by serving with his family in various capacities, including running the sound room for the last four and a half years. Uh, we've trained up a replacement for him since he's about to leave us. For the last three and a half years, Kyle has spent much, as much uh, time as possible working at Camp Victory where he helps out in the kitchen and has served as a CIT. He'll be leaving for Pensacola Christian College in June to work for the summer and then begin classes in the fall. And he plans to major in mechanical engineering. That's Kyle Barker. Amen. 
Haley Hayes is the daughter of Josh and Aaron Hayes. She has attended Paxton School where she is a star on the softball team. Upon graduation, she plans to attend Shelton State Community College on a softball scholarship and major in biomedicine. She then plans to enter medical school and study to become, become? No, become a dermatologist. That's Haley Hayes. There she is. I am very grateful for my wife on this next one because I had typed up all of my notes and she was writing out cards for them. And I said, well, be sure you spell Heidi's name, H Y. And she goes, well, Heidi's not graduating. I was like, let me change my notes. So I'm sorry, <laughs> Cassie, I wrote the wrong name down, but I do know now, Cassie Varnum. Cassie, and I still left it the wrong way in one of my places. Cassie, though, is the daughter of Scott and Amanda Varnum. She has attended Paxton School where she has played on the varsity basketball team for the past four years and has played softball during her senior year. She has been a member of many clubs at Paxton, including FCA, FFA, and the National Honor Society. She will be graduating high school next month and will also have her AA degree due to her work as a dual enrolled student. She plans on furthering her academic pursuits at the University of Central Florida. Cassie. Clint Zorn. Clint is the son of Joseph and Katrina Zorn, also the grandson of Stanley and Cheryl Zorn. Uh, Clint came to live up here because he wanted to go to school at Paxton. He's from Orlando, he wanted to go to high school at Paxton, and so he came up here to stay with Brother Stanley and Miss Cheryl these last few years so he could go to Paxton. Upon graduation, Clint will be accepting a position with Gulf Tech Fire and Security. He will be attending the Florida State Fire College in Ocala, Florida to receive his certification and permits in portable fire extinguishers, pre-engineered wet chemical fire suppression systems, and pre-engineered industrial uh, dry chemical fire systems. I think Bobby wrote some of this. Uh, <laughs> He will be servicing and protecting all types of property from small businesses to government buildings in the tri-state area of Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. For all of your fire suppression needs, please contact Bobby Collins. Oh, <laughs> that, I, added that, I added that part. Uh, uh, but this is Clint Zorn. Uh, this is not a self-serving thing. I assure you, it just so happens I do have a senior, but I'm so grateful for all of the seniors and their families and uh, the time, the effort, the love uh, that has been poured into each of them. Uh, obviously, you know, you can become a senior without that support. It does happen. Many people have done it on their own, but when you have that support, it makes it so much easier whenever you have that love. It's still difficult but it makes it easier and to have that love and support of your family. And so we're so grateful for each of these. So grateful that we're having a senior day at church. This isn't, you know, hey, these folks, they don't go to church, but we'll honor them somewhere and there'll be that, that time for others. But we get to honor them at church today. These are four young people uh, that have been involved throughout the years at our church. And so we're so grateful for them. At this time, I'm going to let the uh, youth workers uh, come and say what they want to say. All right, you seniors and parents, y'all can sit on the front row. We're not going to be that long, but we'll let y'all sit down. Um, I'm going to start with Kyle. Brother Davis sort of give you a lot of details on them, uh, where they're going to school and uh, uh, parents. And I'm going to talk about each one of them. Uh, start with Kyle. Um, Kyle is not just a sound guy here. He is uh, one of our youth. I know a lot of you come in every week, and Kyle's back there diligently running our sound. But past five years, we've watched Kyle grow. Uh, he's actually passed all his family members in hype now. <laughs> um, you know, uh, went from seeing Kyle uh, this high, and then all of a sudden he's driving in that uh, red minivan. We're passing Nikki, and she's holding on over there desperately. <laughs> and Kyle's driving, and. Uh, Kyle, uh, if you had never been around Kyle, he is hilarious. I know he's quiet, he doesn't say a lot, but we went on a trip with him, and uh, all of a sudden we're on the way back, and he's back there singing, and uh, just cutting up, and uh, that, that was early on, and, and uh, we got got to know Kyle. Um, he, uh, like I say, his passion for a CIT, I remember the first uh, letter I got on Kyle to uh, send a recommendation to Camp Victory. Uh, he's very passionate about that, serving others, uh, working at camp. Um, 
you know, where he's going to be going on to Pensacola Christian and uh, have another uh, platform there to uh, represent Christ. But uh, he, uh, I tell you, Nikhil, he's comfortable in his own skin. He uh, is very uh, passionate about his sleep, I'll go ahead and tell you that. Because we went to beach retreat and everybody's ready to stay up all night and come eat 30 cows ready to lay down. He don't care who it is, he's going to let you know he's ready to get in bed and that's, that's his thing. But uh, we're going to really miss Kyle, uh, enjoy his knowledge. Uh, when we're going through uh, scripture, he's very knowledgeable of scripture. And uh, just going to really miss Kyle. Haley Hayes, I think Josh carries around a picture of Haley. She was born with a softball helmet on. That girl has been playing softball. If she's a beast on the softball field. And she's this quiet little girl, shy, but she's a beast out there on the softball field. If, if you've seen her play, then you know what we're talking about. And uh, I got to uh, witness Haley getting saved at Beast Retreat. And it was just, uh, you know, as I think about it and go back, a lot of the kids had went down. And uh, just the prayer Haley prayed that day it was so sincere, so humble, and... Uh, uh, just was a, a blessing to be with. Um, as he said, she's going on to Sheldon State on a softball scholarship. And, you know, we all have platforms. That's what he talked about. So she'll have another platform to represent Christ. I know her parents are proud of her. We're going to miss Haley. Uh, Cassie's the next one. That's our red. I've always said Cassie was born for her sister Sadie. Uh, she gives Sadie another year of a pacifier when Sadie was weaned from it and uh, at an early age. And then she uh, has... Uh, uh, kept Sadie safe. If you know Sadie, you know what I'm talking about. She's always been there for her sister. Uh, she uh, has always been that kid that was observant. And whenever you went somewhere, the other kids couldn't tell you how you got there. Cassie could tell you how to get there and tell you an alternate route to get back home. Uh, so she's been always been uh, very observant, uh, always very dependent, uh, independent. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I was really thrilled this year when we did our uh, shoebox ministry. Uh, we all took the kids shopping. They all got to get things for uh, the uh, kids in their shoebox ministry. And just seeing how passionate Cassie was, um, it, you know, and getting those kids. I mean, they wouldn't want to go and leave. I mean, they were really passionate about getting those kids uh, that don't have a lot. And uh, as a parent and a youth minister, I was just, it blessed my heart to see that. Um, and uh, she is going to go uh, into forensic science is what she plans to do right now. And I think that will fit her well because she has always been that kid that just wants to know. And uh, she was saved here at a very early age and baptized right there in that uh, uh, right up here behind us. And uh, we are uh, definitely going to gonna miss Cassie uh, here in our youth program. Clint Zorn. Uh, Clint... Uh, He's been uh, here with us several years. You know, the small church, we get the opportunity a lot of times to uh, see kids, as, as I said, on the softball field. Uh, and, and Clint, uh, he came to work with me. Stanley brought him over to the house. And when he first came over there, he had a pair of Crocs on. And he just, he had a lot to learn. Had a lot to learn. And, uh, but I tell you, I, I shared with Bobby the other day uh, how much Clint has grown. Just. Uh, you know, when you're riding on country roads with them and you're talking to them and trying to give them advice and talk to them and uh, just uh, some of the things, Clint has just grown up so much. I can't get the boy to stop me now when he works with me. He's just wanting to, wanting to keep going. And, uh, but uh, he's always, he's been real quiet, but he's always been involved. Whatever we did in our youth, uh, Chris and them can attest to this, he's always been involved and never had been the one to just sit over there and, and not be involved. Um, he uh, is going to start with Gulf Tech. Uh, I know he's proud about that. I asked him yesterday, I said, what's the plan, Clint? He said, a day I, after I graduate, I'm going. He's ready to go to fire school. So, uh, you know, uh, college, whatever it is uh, that we have, uh, you know, these kids have, they've got a plan, and Clint's got a plan. And uh, so, uh, Clint, we're going to miss him, uh, as all these youth. And as I was reflecting this morning, as we, as we do this every year, and, I, and I've got one more to go through here, I was just thinking about our youth and, uh, you know, I, I mentioned it each year about all these workers and about everybody that has an opportunity to invest. As Brother David was saying uh, from Ms. Glenda, just everybody that has a part of that Wednesday night program, um, just to invest in anything you can uh, in these kids because they are our future and that's what we're, that's what we're here for. Uh, and like Brother Dave said, if, if they are raised in church, then there's an opportunity later on in life. Even if they do stray, that they will come back. 
And uh, so we, we're just blessed. I know as, as, as working with the youth, we're just blessed. I, I was thinking back about Phil and Jordy when they were a little bitty and going camping. And, uh, you know, and, and that's been a long time ago. I mean, Jordy, I definitely want him on my tug of war team now because we played tug of war that night. And uh, they were some of the little guys. But I just look at several of you out there that we've been up here and have been up here talking about. And uh, we're just so blessed and, and, you know, thankful here for them. So I'm going to turn it over to Krista now. Sure you don't want to talk? Thank you. Um, so Scott comes up, he tells you about the, um, our youth, our seniors that are graduating, and then I just hit a few high points that I'd like to share with the congregation. Last year somebody recorded me, and I went back and watched that over and over and over, and it's amazing that 366 days ago, I was sitting in the same place that you are with my last baby. So um, I want to speak more to the church and more to the parents. I, I have some challenges also. Nobody prepared me. I watched seniors leave every year, and it hurt, but nobody prepared me when my last baby left. So I want to challenge you as a church. Last year I challenged you to pray for those that went ahead and pray for those that were leaving now. I want to challenge you to please pray for the parents also. Pray for our parents and our church as their, as their seniors go out into this world. As Brother David said, it is difficult and life is going to be hard. It's going to be hard for them, but it's also going to be hard for our parents who are left here without them. Um, society is so hard. And I know that we have taught you well. What you face, no matter where it is, that you will strive and that you will hold on to the grace and the compassion and the faith that you have. Because you have been taught it at home and you have been taught it here and I've watched you carry it through all these years. Always remember that this is home regardless of where you're at and we are still here for you. My phone rings at midnight and I answer it. So no matter where you're at, you can call me at midnight, Clint. That means you need to store my phone number, son, so you can answer my text messages. <laughs> For you to call me at midnight would mean that you would need to store my number. However, if you need any of us, we're here for you. This is home. Last year I told the seniors, make sure you take your cross with you. You plant it and you pick it up. So when you leave, this little town and you go off to college and you go off and you start your career because Clint it's going to be hard for you too baby because the people of the world are mean you take your cross with you and you put it down where you're at and when you leave there you pick it up and you take it to your next place um, we're always going to be your safe place and I challenge you as seniors for this a small amount of time will renew your strength when you struggle, because this first year is going to be hard, when you struggle, you stop. You take a small amount of time for yourself, and that will renew your strength for you to continue to push on. We love y'all. I want to thank the church for everything you do for our youth, everything you do for our youth group. I want to thank our youth workers. Mr. Stanley's out here. Miss Amanda's right here. Mr. Scott. Wes, we always drag him along with us too. Uh, Brother David, Miss Nikki, I don't think y'all know how much we appreciate um, y'all for allowing us to love these children and allowing us to be the word for this church. Um, I'm going to try not to cry, so I'm going to quit. We are so proud of y'all. We love y'all so much, and we know that God's going to keep you safe. Well, thank you. Thank y'all so much. Again, we are so proud of all of the seniors and their families. And, uh, you know, we are so grateful for our youth workers. We've got just a great team. And again, these are only some of them, um, as we've got others that uh, are out there. Uh, we are so thankful for those that work with our youth and that pour into them. And, and listen, if you've never worked with youth, you know that whole thing I was talking about, sometimes life is difficult. 
Whew. Working with youth is awesome, and it's always perfect and fun. Um, no, hey, sometimes it's hard. Uh, we've, we've put a lot of years into youth, even before coming into the pastorate, put a lot of years into, into youth. And it's, it's fun when things are going great, but sometimes there's hard times, and you've got you to gotta be there for them at all hours, and you've got to go walk with them through those hard times. And we've even just recently had some things where we were, we were walking through some hard times. Uh, with some of our youth and so you know I really appreciate our youth workers so I know today's about the seniors but I just want to say that again how, how appreciative I am for our youth workers